welcome to this uh, session. Um, we have a few talks, just to remind everyone of how we're going to do this. Uh, there are three main talks and two short ones. The main talks are 12 minutes and then uh, questions after that. Then this is followed by a Q&A afterwards. Uh, so our first talk, our first speaker will be Maxime Mulamba. And he's going to talk about hybrid classification and reasoning for image-based constraint solving. So without further ado, Maxime, take it away. Hello everyone and thank you for joining. My name is Maxime and I'm going to tell you more about uh, our work uh, titled Hybrid Classification and Reasoning for Image-Based Constraint Solving. This talk will be divided into four main parts. So first, uh, the problem setting, then I will describe the solving approach, then we will explore further improvement and finally I will discuss some results. So many decision problems involve uh, dealing with uncertain inputs coming from raw sensor data such as text or images. Um, an illustration of that kind of problem is the visual Sudoku. So this is rather straightforward to understand. We have a uh, Sudoku where uh, inputs are given as unwritten digits, so images instead of numerical value, and this makes it impractical for a uh, common solver such as a cons uh, constraint programming solver to and deal with uh, an instance of the puzzle. Okay, before we move on, let me go over some properties of sudoku puzzles so in a sudoku a digit on each row each column and each three by three subgrid should be unique uh, these global uh, constraints make it uh, practical to be solved with a constraint programming solver and we also have the property that each sudoku puzzle admits a unique solution for a set of given clue this is usually ignored as we Consider that uh, instances uh, given to a solver are valid, but this will be relevant later on. A naive approach to solve that kind of problem is to proceed in a two-stage uh, manner. So, as displayed in the image here, you start from uh, your visual Sudoku for each cell you would tr uh, use a train uh, classifier, so in this case a Linnet, for example, to compute probability uh, of this image belonging to uh, all of your possible classes. Then you will take the argmax label, argmax class, and assign this class uh, to the image. Once you've done this for all of your given image, you have uh, an initial Sudoku puzzle that you can uh, call your solver on and okay, you finally get a solution. But we would like to have a more hybrid approach where the solver would actually reason over probabilities. So what we want is a solution that satisfies all puzzle constraints, but does, does so while maximizing the joint probabilities over all given images, and later give us an objective function that we can now maximize under the Sudoku constraint. And this way, the visual Sudoku is formulated as a constraint optimization problem. So now let's explore some possible improvements. The first source of improvement comes from uh, the optimization side. So as I said, Visual Sudoku is now a constraint optimization problem, which means that it has potentially many feasible solutions. But as we already discussed, each Sudoku puzzles should only have one unique solution for a set of givens. So we can actually exploit this higher order knowledge this time. How? Easy. 
when a solver finds an optimal solution, we can add the resulting assignment as a no good and try to solve again. And if any feasible solution is found, this means that the partial assignment uh, previously found does not lead to a unique solution and therefore it's not the right one. All right, another source of possible improvement comes from the classification side. So we have an hybrid approach, which is reasoning over probabilities. And in the literature, um, from the literature, uh, output score ranging uh, from zero to one coming from dense neural network should not really be considered as probabilities. Why? Because because of the way they are trained, they tend to be over or under confident. And over or under confident prediction in our case can hinder the solving because we are reasoning over all probabilities. One way to overcome this would be to look at calibration. So calibration methods, they learn a mapping from these non-network output scores to probabilities which match the true probability distribution for each class. So we investigated uh, several variants of plat scaling, which is one calibration method. And you can see on the table here that if you look at the negative log likelihood loss on the validation set, which is uh, one matrix used to assess the calibration quality of a model, we see that matrix scaling yields the most calibrated model. Let's now have a look at some empirical results. Um, before moving on with the remainder, the, the remaining of this section, uh, quick notes on uh, the columns here. So we devised four um, quality measure measurements. So the image accuracy, first column, uh, described the actual accuracy on the classification task. So we we'll look at uh, how the approach is able to classify each given clue as the correct uh, digit. The cell accuracy is the accuracy of uh, every cells in each Sudoku puzzle. And then the grid accuracy denotes the actual capacity of uh, an approach of finding, of solving a, a visual Sudoku and finding the true solution. So not only a feasible solution, but a feasible solution that matched the actual true solution for this instance. And then on the opposite, the failure rate uh, for the grid uh, depicts uh, the proportion of instance for which the, the approach was not able to find any feasible solution. So every experiment will run on a set of 3,000 uh, visual Sudoku puzzles. Uh, and the baseline here is the two-stage approach that was presented uh, at the beginning. Hybrid one correspond to uh, our hybrid approach and hybrid two correspond to uh, the hybrid one augmented with uh, the higher order knowledge exploitation. And you can see that start. So in that case, we are considering a, a rather weak classifier. So which has only 94% uh, accuracy initially. So this is what gives what is displayed on the for the baseline. And you can see that when we consider the same classifier, but used within the hybrid one uh, approach, uh, the hybrid one approach is able to correct the, the accuracy of this weak classifier up to by a percentage of five. So another advantage of the hybrid approach is its flexibility. So there, there is a trade-off between computational costs and performance that we can uh, restrict the solver to only consider top K prediction during the search. K being here uh, an hyperparameter. Uh, and 
as you can see on the on this table here, um, reducing the K uh, actually decreases uh, the computational cost, but this is the, uh, also decreasing uh, the actual performance. So the image accuracy, but more importantly, the grid accuracy. You can also see that as soon as we consider a top a K of four, the grid failure uh, drops to zero, meaning that we are we don't we are only we are always able to solve uh, visual Sudoku instances, although we not we are not always finding the actual true solution. Finally, we investigated the effects of calibration uh, in using this context. Uh, and as you can see here, so calibration uh, seems to have a positive effect on regarding performances, which is uh, especially stronger when you consider uh, a limited search space. So the X axis here, uh, this time display the K parameter. So, and the effect of calibration is stronger when you reduce the search space, but it is still present, although uh, uh, reduced and more less important when we go up to uh, K equals to, to nine. Let me wrap up. In summary, so I presented this hybridization of classification and constraint reasoning uh, on the visual Sudoku problem. Uh, constraint reasoning uh, over the probabilistic prediction outperform a pure reasoning approach. So when we consider the argmax label from the classifier, um, we also showed that there was room for further improvements by considering uh, higher order relations into account on the solving side and by using calibrated probabilistic classifier on the classification side. And finally, uh, empirical experiments show that uh, there is a possible trade-off uh, when we limit the reasoning to top K probabilities. Uh, I will conclude with a brief uh, overview of some future work, which is actually uh, what we've been busy with for the past few months. So future work in that case includes uh, exploring other application uh, with different classification tasks or with different optimization tasks. And uh, another uh, possible direction would be to actually consider the output of the solver as possible feedback to train the underlying predictive model. Thank you for listening. And uh, if you have any question, I will do my best to provide the answers. Thank you. All right, thank you, Maxime. Uh, we have time, I believe, uh, for a few questions, about three minutes before we, we switch. Uh, so any question from the whole group? I don't see anything in the chat yet, but there is a lot of information there for the scheduling. While we're waiting for one, ah, there is one from Neil. Uh, what other problems have you been trying? Okay, so for in this paper, we have only been looking at the visual Sudoku, but uh, this approach is uh, solver agnostic. So meaning that, uh, as as long as you have uh, a similar problem with a certain input, you could consider uh, this approach. And we have actually been looking at uh, a related problem. So scheduling in that case, for example, where uh, you have to uh, deal with uncertain uh, input. Uh, so the, 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 the value assigned to each job, for example, uh, So that's that's an example, and yeah, other possible application could be something like uh, uh, consistency check on tax sheets, for example.
Okay, thank you. Um, I was thinking about this deep neural network very often. Layers in the in the neural network really correspond to extracting higher level structure, uh, graphical structure. So they're extracting semantics to some extent. Uh, and it sounds here that the solver is also extracting semantic structure by basically saying, uh, if you were go to go down that path, there is more than one solution. So that's not a valid Sudoku. Can you comment a little bit on, on whether there is a way to exploit that kind of connection between the two uh, more so extensively? That's a, an interesting question. The whole point uh, on this work here was to actually exploit the fact that generally, we actually have a solver that have been uh, specialized to deal with that kind of problem. And instead of trying to do everything in the machine learning side of thing, the idea was to, okay, how can we actually explore uh, the knowledge embedded into the solver and combine this with uh, the machine learning approach? So here we are, we are doing this uh, forward pass, I would say only where we, use the prediction, the probabilities of the, the, the machine learning uh, into, with the solver. One way to, to, to do it one step further would be to actually try to use uh, the output of the server to uh, guide, so to speak, uh, the, 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 the predictive model into learning actually the underlying structure of the problem. So, and this is uh, I'm actually, an active field of research and a, di a direction that we are actually considering right now. Okay, thank you. Uh, one very last one, but let's do this quickly. Florian is asking the following. The digits in your instance seems to be written by different people. Could you exploit similarities in a single person's and writing to improve the overall performance for practical cases? Yeah, so that would be, uh, for example, it, if we if we had so instead of just a digit, we will have like historical data for each user, where for each user we will have a digit written by this user. Then we could also instead of just exploring, um, instead of just yeah, using the the, the, the digit themselves, we could also considering yeah using this historical data. So that's it will just be a matter of changing the architecture of your network in that case. But yeah, it's something that could be possible and I would expect it to improve uh, over our results. Good, thank you. So let's all thanks Maxime and move on to the next talk. I'm transferring the energy from everyone, otherwise <laughs> it will take a while. <laughs> all right, good. Yes, thank you, Emmanuel. That's good. Uh, so next talk um, is, here's the title. Um, a learning-based algorithm to quickly obtain good primal solutions for stochastic integer programs. And who's my speaker? I'm looking at the grid, but there are too many. Wrong paper, is it? Hello everyone, I'm Rahul. I will be presenting our work on using machine learning to quickly obtain good primal solutions to the two-state stochastic integer programs, shortly known as TOSIP. This is a joint work with Joshua, Emma, Andrea, and Sriram. The talk is divided into three main sections. I will start by introducing the TOSIP and the key formulations. This will lead to the research question and the core idea of our work. Lastly, I will talk about the experimental details and the results that we obtain. Hope you find it interesting. TOSIP can be used to model decision-making problems under uncertainty. That is, some of the problem data is not known in advance while you are making the decision. Instead, what you do have access to is some distribution from which those uncertain values will be sampled. Thus, you need to make a decision hedging against all the possible realizations of the problem data instead of deterministically optimizing for some fixed value. Here, X is the first decision variable that has some linear cost and linear constraints associated with it. Once we fix X, we observe the uncertain parameters psi. After observing the uncertain parameters psi, we are allowed to make the second stage decision Y. The cost and the constraints associated with Y are governed by the uncertainty realization and the first stage decision. Note that both X and Y can take integer values. 
Let us look at an example to understand this better. Consider the standard capacitated facility location problem. Here, we have a set of potential locations to open a facility and a set of clients, each with some demand. We need to decide three things. First, a subset of locations where we would like to open a facility. Second, what capacity to install in those open facilities such that the demand of all the clients is satisfied. And third, an assignment of facilities to clients to meet their demand. While making these decisions, we must try to minimize the total cost of operating a facility and the transportation cost from facility to its clients. This problem is easy as the demand of a client is known in advance. Now consider the case in which these demands are random and not known exactly while you are setting up the facilities. What is known is the distribution from which those random demands are realized. We can model this problem as a two-set. In this situation, we want that our decision about the facilities to be opened and the capacities we install in them behaves optimally in expectation when encountered with different demand realizations. Once the client demand is realized, the task is to minimize the assignment cost between open facilities and clients. Note that the key motivation to solve a two-sip is to find the optimal first stage decisions as finding the optimal second stage decision is trivial. A naive way to obtain the optimal first stage decision to a two-sip is by solving a large mixed integer program called the extensive formulation. Here, capital Z is the set of all possible scenarios, X is the first stage decision, and YZ is the second stage decision associated with scenario Z. The constraint data matrix has a special L-shaped structure because of the way in which the constraints associated with the second stage variables interact with each other. The drawback of this formulation is the dependence of its size on the number of scenarios. The size of the formulation increases with the increase in the number of scenarios. On the other hand, if we solve this formulation to optimality, we have access to the optimal first stage decision and the objective value. For any given extensive formulation, we can associate a surrogate formulation. A surrogate formulation is a special case of the extensive formulation with only one scenario in the uncertainty set. Note that this single scenario need not be present in the original uncertainty set, capital Z. We call this single scenario Xi bar. Thus, we can construct many surrogates for a given extensive form for each corresponding Xi bar. When we solve the surrogate formulation, the optimality of the first stage decision is not guaranteed. However, this first stage solution will be feasible to the original extensive formulation as we still satisfy the AX less than or equals to B constraints given complete recourse. The good thing though is that the uncertainty set contains only one scenario. This leads to a much smaller formulation that can be solved quickly. Looking at the pros and cons of both the extensive and surrogate formulations, a key question which comes to mind is, can we have best of both the worlds? Can we get close to optimality in as little time as possible? In our context, this essentially translates to the question, can we find a surrogate whose first stage solution is also an optimal solution to the original two set? The scenario Xi bar with that can be used to form such a surrogate is called representative scenario. The term representative underscores the fact that hedging against this scenario is, in a way, equivalent to hedging against all the scenarios in the original uncertainty set as it leads to optimal first stage decisions. Note that more than one representative scenario can exist for an instance. However, finding a representative scenario can be hard. Hence, we try to estimate it. This essentially translates to the question, can we find a good surrogate whose first stage solution is a near optimal solution to the original two sip? Constructing a representative scenario is the key to quickly obtain good first stage solution. We propose a two-phased strategy for the same. In the first phase, we focus on designing heuristics specific to a problem class that can generate a representative scenario. This leads to a data set of instances and their corresponding representative scenario. In the second phase, we use this data set to train a predictive model that learns to map an instance to its representative scenario. Generating a representative scenario for new instance simply boils down to querying this trained model. Thus, to quickly obtain a good first stage decision, we solve the surrogate formed using the predicted representative scenario. 
Obtaining first stage decision in this manner is significantly faster than solving the extensive form. To validate our idea of obtaining near optimal primal solutions quickly using a representative scenario, we conduct experiments on the synthetically generated data for the stochastic capacitated facility location problem. The formulation has binary and continuous variables both in the first and second stages. The instances have 10 clients and 10 potential facility locations to choose from. To ensure complete recourse, we introduce a hub facility that has infinite capacity but significantly higher costs. To train the machine learning model, we generate 50,000 instances in total. We solve these instances with a 10 minute time limit or a 2% optimality gap. Out of these 50,000 instances, we were able to estimate a representative scenario using heuristics for around 49,000 of them. We use 45,000 instances in training and the remaining for testing. In terms of model, we use linear regression and artificial neural network. We compare the machine learning based methods against the baselines formed by three different surrogates. First, we form the surrogate by taking the average of all scenarios in the original uncertainty set. Second, we form the surrogate by using the scenario obtained by sampling from a uniform distribution. Finally, we form the surrogate by randomly selecting one of the scenarios from the original uncertainty set. The gold standard against which we compare different methods to is the objective value obtained by solving the extensive form using Kurobi. To evaluate the first stage decision obtained using different methods, we calculate the objective value difference ratio or OVDR for short. It gives the percentage gap between objective value obtained by solving the extensive form and the objective value obtained by a given method. When OVDR is zero for some method, it means that the objective value obtained by that method and the objective value obtained by solving the extensive form are the same. We also compare the time taken by various methods to obtain the first stage solution. For the learning based methods, the time taken is the total of the time taken to extract features, making predictions and solving the surrogate. During the training, the ML based methods tries to minimize the mean square error between the predictor representative scenario and the representative scenario found using heuristics. Thus, we have a learning metric that is the mean square error and the optimization metric that is the OVDR to evaluate the performance of an ML based model. Note that during training, we optimize the learning metric and hope that we achieve good performance in terms of the optimization metric during testing. We now give the statistics of the objective value difference ratio obtained by various methods. We observe that the machine learning based methods perform better than the baselines. The average OVDR for linear regression and artificial neural network is 0.64% and 1.02% respectively. This shows that the objective value obtained by the machine learning based methods is comparable to that of Kurobi. The minimum OVDR for some methods is negative. This happens as we had set the minimum optimality cap to 2% as a stopping criterion while solving the extensive form. Hence, there is scope by other methods to surpass it. Next, we look at the time taken by different methods. In terms of the average time taken while solving the instances in the test set, Gurobi takes more time than the machine learning based methods and the machine learning based methods takes more time than baselines. It is worthwhile to note that the machine learning based methods are two orders of magnitude faster than Gurobi on average to obtain the first stage solution. We summarize the results of the average OVDR and the average time taken by different methods using a scatter plot. The x axis shows the average time taken by different methods in log scale. The y axis shows the average OVDR obtained by different methods. The ideal spot in this chart is the bottom left corner. This spot represents 0% cap achieved in 0 seconds. We now show the results of the baseline methods. They perform good in terms of solution time. However, their performance is bad in terms of the average OVDR. Gurobi, on the other hand, has zero average OVDR but takes significantly more time. Machine learning based methods tries to achieve best of both the worlds. 
they are able to produce good primal solutions in significantly less time. We also check the time taken by Gurobi to produce a solution as good as the machine learning based methods. This shows that it is difficult for Gurobi to produce a solution of the same quality as linear regression for artificial neural network in a comparable time. To summarize, we presented a machine learning based method to obtain good primal solutions to 2 sip quickly. Currently, we are working on extending the work to different problem sizes and problem types. This will not only help us discover the cases in which our method fails, but also give us an opportunity to improve it. During the experimentation, we observed that there was a mismatch between the learning metric and the optimization metric. When a model achieves better mean square error, it need not necessarily mean that the model will have a better average OVDR as compared to the other model. Linear regression performed poorly in terms of the learning metric but was able to beat artificial neural network in terms of the optimization metric. We would like to study this problem in detail and come up with a loss function that alleviates this issue. All right, thank you very much. Uh, first thing, I need to apologize. I managed to actually switch uh, the two talks. I was distracted by a side conversation. So the talk that was at, four, uh, at uh, 2.45 uh, Central Eastern, Central European time will be now. Um, but before that, uh, we have time for a few questions. Uh, so, one question from Emmanuel. Uh, would it make sense to reduce the number of scenarios to some manageable number, like one of the representative scenarios? Uh, some manageable number as in like uh, not exactly equal to one, but something more than one? Um, I assume uh, so. Uh, I think yes, that is uh, possible, but we do not uh, currently look at that particular aspect. Right now, we only focus on, you know, uh, how can we try to extract the best possible or try to construct the best possible scenario out of the given possible scenarios that we have. Okay. One question from Kevin, maybe somewhat related, asking, have you compared against scenario sampling approaches? So, for example, not just picking at random, but using some clustering techniques or centroids in Voronoi diagram sampling, something along those lines. No, we, we haven't uh, tested against those techniques as of now. All right. Um, any other questions? No, I'm looking at the clock, so I'm trying to stay. So thank you very much. <laughs> Sending applauses again uh, for, for everyone. Uh, in the meantime, um, let's go to the next talk, which will be this time uh, reinforcement learning for variable selection in the branch inbound algorithm. And uh, let's take it away. Hello, everyone. My name is Mark Etev, and today we are going to discuss about interactions between machine learning and combinatorial optimization. And mainly, we will be focusing on how machine learning can be used to solve combinatorial optimization problems. So, in one sentence, uh, we'll try to learn branching policies in a branch and bound algorithm using reinforcement learning. This work has been carried out during my PhD thesis, supervised by Electricité de France, which is the French largest energy supplier, and by the University of Lucknow. Here is the outline of the presentation. So first, we will briefly review some of the ideas regarding interactions between machine learning and combinatorial optimization, which is quite a new and active field of research right now. Next, the method we propose will be presented, followed by some experiments and a short conclusion. Okay, let's first give some general context regarding the interactions between machine learning and combinatorial optimization. So the word interaction suggests a two-way relationship, right? But here we will only focus on how machine learning can be used to solve CO problems. Before looking at how it can be done, let's briefly introduce the branch and bound method, which will be the algorithm we consider for solving mixed integer linear problems. In two words, a general branch and bound algorithm solves mixed integer linear programs by creating a partition of the feasible region following a tree structure. The solution is found by solving the linear relaxation on each node and by cutting the nodes proven to be either suboptimal or infeasible. Variable selection and node selections mainly govern the growth of the tree and are often considered as two of the main keys for good performance of such algorithms. 
Okay, now we want to incorporate some machine learning, right? So the question is, how can we do it? So machine learning is basically an art of approximation. So a legitimate question raised when applying it to combinatorial optimization is, do we want to solve to optimality a given problem? So if the answer is no, a natural idea would be to learn directly the solution, for example. If the answer is yes, there are multiple ways to leverage machine learning, for instance, in a branch and bound algorithm. And indeed, many work focus on branch and bound, often to decrease the tree size or the computation time. The choices in such algorithms are mainly heuristically made, and as a consequence, the main levels for machine learning consist naturally in replacing these heuristics. So by example, for example, by learning to cut, so to improve the linear relaxation, by learning node selection, which influences the order for visiting nodes, or by learning variable selection, also known as branching, which influences the partition process. Many papers propose to mimic an existing heuristic by learning its behavior, so with the use of an expert. And as far as we're concerned, we will learn to create, to discover a brand new decision rule for variable selection, so without the use of any expert. Before presenting our method, let's specify our settings. So we face a single problem and must solve on a recurrent basis different instances of this problem given some fluctuating data. As an example, you may think of the unit commitment problem of satisfying a heat demand for multiple time steps given some predicted gas prices. The problem is exchanged, all the instances are the same size and same structure that represent the same problem, but the data, prices and demands, A, B, and C, are different across instances. So as for any machine learning program, we have at our disposal a history of instances that we can use to learn any object we want to learn, so basically, usually parameters. And once we've done that, we will test it on new and seen instances. Recall our objective is to discover a new branching policy. You may guess that the appropriate learning paradigm is reinforcement learning. So quickly, reinforcement learning is a framework where an agent, like a human, learns by trial and error. And what you will learn is to design efficient action policies in its environment. So he faces a state, selects an action, which leads to a new state, and potentially observes the reward or a cost. The objective is then to find a policy that leads, in average, to sequences with high rewards or low cost. So for those familiar with reinforcement learning, you can notice the high difficulty of what we plan to do here. Usually, like when playing Go or chess or whatever game, we try to find a good trajectory or branch in a tree of possible decision. Here, we will try to find a good tree within a collection of possible trees, which seems to be a bit more difficult. So let's see how we can do that and how we can transpose this notion to what we try to do here. So we call state node in a branch and bound tree and any information available at the time this node is processed. So incumbents, history of branching decision, anything. Then an action at a state is a branching decision at the corresponding node. The environment is the linear solver given all its parameters and is assumed to be non-stochastic. So now the crucial question is what is the cost of an action or the negative reward if you prefer. The definition of the cost of an action is really important and yet to be done. So let's see how to define it. So from now on, we consider that our objective is to design a parameterized branching policy which leads in average to small trees. So the objective is minimize the tree size. A natural solution would be to predict all choices within a tree with the same cost, for instance, the generated tree size. This approach naturally ensures that taking actions with minimal cost produces minimal trees, so it would be in adequation with our global objective. However, it would be inefficient and an admission of weakness, actually. Indeed, as we don't know how to evaluate precisely the actions and detect the important ones, we give to all of them the same cost. This issue is known as a credit assignment problem and makes the learning task difficult. We don't know how to focus on important choices. So let's see how we can partially address this issue. Rather than setting the cost of an action to the size of the whole tree, we set it to the size of the subtree rooted in the current node. In general, this choice is suboptimal with respect to the whole tree size. Indeed, sometimes we may want to branch on variables that produce large subtrees in order to find quickly good feasible solutions and allowing other nodes to be hardly pruned by bond. However, we we'll prove that this choice is optimal when the node selection strategy is depth first search. 
as a consequence, our method consists in trying to map any state, so any node of a branch and branch tree, to the branching decision which produces the smallest subtree. Now the objective is clearly set, let's go quickly into the method details. We use approximate learning, which comes down to define a function qpy, which maps a state and an action to a cost. Here's the subtree size of state s given the branching decision a and the policy pi under s. This Q function is not analytic, of course, but is observable on the tree is fully expanded. We approximate it by a neural network, which takes as input a simple encoding of a state and outputs the cost for each action. A policy pi theta here consists in taking the minimum over the predicted Q values. The loss we use for training our neural network is simply the mean squared error of the predicted Q values. So this is basically what we will do with some additional features like epsilon greedy exploration, prioritized experience replay, and normalization of the loss function. We also propose a multiplicative dueling architecture, which is displayed here. And um, the product that you can see here between static and dynamic features allow us to better take into account the variability of the chosen Q function. To conclude and stand back from the method, here is the training algorithm we use. So quickly, we just draw an instance from the training set, solve it with the current policy, update the policy using the observed errors, which are given by the observable Q function, and iterate. So just a simple training process we use. Let's take a look now on the experiments. So we tested our method on two different real world problems provided by Electricité de France. And coming from, on the one hand, a heat and electricity microwave case, and on the other hand, from a hydroelectric valley. The problems are kept voluntarily small, and we will explain this choice later. We compare our method with the strong branching policy and CPLEX with neither resolving nor cut generation. Three network architectures are tested with similar number of nodes and layers for allowing a fair comparison. MDA is the one we propose to handle the variability of the chosen Q function. Drilling is its additive counterpart and dense, well, it's simply a dense architecture. The experiments are randomized and the results are averaged. The figure shows the average number of nodes on test instances as a function of the number of training iterations. The curve of interest is the yellow one as it represents the result of the MDA agent we design. The dotted lines that you can see in red and black um, are constant since they represent benchmarks performance, so without any learning. And uh, seeing this figure, we can underline three points. So first, we are learning something, which is actually a good point indeed. We can observe the decrease of the number of nodes during the learning process. Second, we compete with the benchmarks, which is another good point. And the MDA agent seems to perform better than the other architectures. And last, you can notice that actually the instances to use are really easy to solve. And in fact, this is a limitation to our method. You can see that at the beginning of the learning process, the agent produces large trees as it chooses mainly actions uh, random, the random actions. And unfortunately, for larger problems, it makes the, the training time prohibiting, and this is a, actually our battle horse right now, how to make the method scalable with larger and more difficult problems. To conclude, we recall that this is a novel approach with promising results, but also with scalability issues for now. The problem, in my opinion, is not due to complex distributions to fit, but to result to the sizes of spaces and more specifically, the fact that the computation time, so during learning process, grows exponentially with these sizes. Hopefully, we may think of different ways to solve these issues, for instance, by reducing the size of the action space, by taking control only for the first branching decisions, by using an expert at the beginning of the learning process, or any other idea. So I will end my talk with these little touches of hope and I thank you very much for listening to me and please do not hesitate for any question you may have. All right, thank you very much, Mark. Um, maybe we, we can take one quick question and 
the windows is jumping. Uh, one came in from Johan. Uh, he was basically asking, did you test this on CP search as well? Yeah, uh, actually, we only tested on uh, the two, uh, two different problems showed in the presentation. And uh, it was because uh, this is problems coming from uh, ADF and uh, we didn't test it so on other exam instances. So maybe uh, it could be a good idea to test on CP as well. So the method could uh, work as well, I guess. Okay, uh, so there are several questions uh, coming in. Uh, I don't think we'll have the time to take all of them right now. Uh, I'll just do one more, but please uh, use the Q&A session at 4.20 uh, to actually go on with the conversation. Uh, I'll take the one from Sherdar because it's, it seems I like it. Uh, do you have any insights or interpretation into what the branching strategy uh, that reinforcement learning is picking up? No, actually, uh, it's uh, it's quite difficult to to understand uh, the choices it made, and uh, we only see that uh, for some instances it's very difficult for it to to find a good uh, branching policies, and uh, I guess after a while of exploring, exploring, guess a good uh, strategy, but uh, we don't figure out still uh, how we make uh, each choices, and for now the features we gave to the neural network are extremely simple, so I guess it he doesn't uh, understand uh, quite a lot. Okay. All right, thank you very much. So once again, thank you for your talk. Um, now we have two short talks um, and there will not be questions for those uh, at the end of the talk. So please uh, make use of the Q&A section, session at 4.20. And with that, let's roll the tape. First one, a reinforcement learning approach to the labeled maximum matching problem. In the next five minutes, I'm going to try and introduce you to one of our projects that came out of A, um, considering a coloring problem with quantum computing, and B, the observation that reinforcement learning is heavily researched, yet lacks many practical applications. And so we thought, considering these type of very, very practical problems that we know from classical OR with reinforcement learning, might start to bridge that gap. The problem we consider is the labeled maximum matching problem. The maximum matching problem is the following. You take a graph. A matching is then a subset of non-adjacent edges. The maximum matching is the largest, is a largest such set. That's the difference with the maximal matching. Could you come across this? Which in turn means that just the matching can't be enlarged within the graph. With the labeled maximum matching, we are now adding labels to the graph and essentially try to find a maximum matching with the least amount of labels used within it. For more details on classical approaches and on this problem, I will refer to the paper given here or quoted in the abstract. Now, how can we convert this to a reinforcement learning environment? The biggest challenge here is that we actually have this very, very strong condition of M needing to be a maximum matching which would be an optimization problem on its own. And at the same time, we have the minimization problem with the labels. So what we chose to do is for the state, we used the graph or the remaining graph, as you will see in a moment, and a list of labels that we wanted to, that have been used before. And the action is essentially picking an edge. What we're trying to do is build up a maximum matching as follows. Given a current state, if we pick an edge and remove it, we remove also all adjacent edges and add its label to the labels used. What this gives us is essentially definitely a matching because the remaining edges have not been adjacent. And then we can count the size of this matching by having a reward of one at each time step. And at the final time step, we now need to make sure of two things. First of all, that we have a minimum label and maximum matching, meaning we penalize the number of labels used. And at the same time, um, we need to penalize if we didn't generate a maximum matching, which we did by essentially just giving a very large penalty if the number of times this was less than the size of maximum matching. This we can determine classically without the labels, which has obvious runtime benefits. Now, the question that remains is how we get a state encoding of our, of our graph. 
And there we had two choices we considered. The first one was to use a graph neural network, essentially in parallel to DQN and the actual critic methods that all use neural networks to cope, cope with pictures. But we found that this would be a little bit too limiting in the size of the graph and so on. And so we decided to go with a graph to vector embedding instead. Now, unfortunately, I can't go into a lot of details. We, sent, we essentially based our approach on the work of Dai and Adal from earlier this year. However, in their broad approach, they describe a very load-centric approach because they are studying problems like traveling salesperson, which is very, very node-centric. It's about picking the next node. Given that we are here edge-centric, we essentially dualize this and um, consider the same thing for edges instead. As for training, um, instead of doing backward back propagation, which, which we actually can here, um, given that the gradients are getting very, very ugly, we decided to go for a covariance matrix adaption evolutionary strategy, um, which essentially adjusts the size of movement to the variance in the direction of movement and gives quite good convergence guarantees. And with this, I'd like to thank you for your attention. I'm looking forward to the discussion later. All right, thank you very much. Um, now let's uh, roll the tape on the next one. Thank you, Max. Uh, the next talk is on machine learning-based queuing model regression, example selection, feature engineering, and the role of traffic intensity. Uh, so let's go ahead with this one. Hello and welcome to my talk on machine learning based queuing model regression. My name is Roland Brauner. I'm with the University of Vienna, in particular the Department of Business Decisions and Analytics, and I'm happy to give you an overview of my research work in the following five minutes. What I'm going to present is heavily work in progress. So all results that I present are far from final. Fortunately, CPAIOR allows extended abstract submissions that give room for such kind of work in progress. In fact, my talk is about a proof of concept of that queuing model regression based on very simple models with the striving to broaden the scope later on. So what is the motivation and the background of my research? The motivation is to make predictions concerning the mean performance measures of complex queuing systems. That includes queuing models of real world systems, queuing networks that are analytically intractable in most cases. So they usually have non-product form solutions. The final goal is to incorporate those predictions into simulation-based analysis and optimization. So it's all about replacing a simulation model by a surrogate model. This is because analytical approximations are often quite difficult to obtain in a mathematical manner, and therefore the approach is to learn a simulation model. That the learning of a simulation model, of course, requires a lot of example data and not only the data is needed, but also one has to think about the features or the predictors that are used when applying such learning approaches. So we are here at this intersection point of artificial intelligence and operations research. So the classical operations research part is just about queuing theory as it is known since the 1950s and artificial intelligence techniques like those known from machine learning and data science, in particular regression methods. Related work in this area is concerned with, for example, stochastic crying, which is basically Gaussian process regression, response surface methodology approaches, and regression and regression tree approaches. So these are approaches similar to mine, with the only difference that it's about Q mining. So it's not about the prediction of average performance measures. It's more about making use of the log data from existing queuing systems. Due to the strong limited presentation time, I can just present a small excerpt of my research work here. 
and I will focus in the following on the prediction of the average Q length of a multi-server Macovian Q. What we can see here is a plot of that response surface against the traffic intensity and the number of servers. And what, what becomes most apparent is that it is a highly nonlinear response surface. We will later see that this kind of response surface re requires some kind of nonlinear features included in the regression approaches. So standard features can usually be called just the parameters of an MMS queue, like the number of servers, the arrival rate lambda, and the service rate mu. What I call engineered features in the following is the traffic intensity itself. So it's just a combination of the number of servers, the arrival rate, and the, the service rate, and several other expressions composed of these three parameters that usually occur in the formula for the average Q length LQ. In my experiments, I use MMS queues computed using analytical formulas. A full factorial design has been used using different number of servers, using different arrival rates, finally leading to different traffic intensities. The training and test data was generated using between 570 and 1,100 examples with a ratio of 40 to 60. And I also used a much larger holdout set for computing the accuracy using around 8,000 examples. What we can see here is accuracy results for LQ regression based on an increasing number of features, nonlinear features that have been added in a cumulative fashion. So with seven and eight features, we obtain the highest R squared values that in fact, provides evidence that those nonlinear features play an important role in LQ prediction. So, obviously, those nonlinear features help capture LQ response surfaces. They considerably increase the accuracy in terms of R squared values. It also turns out that. By using those nonlinear features, it is also possible to use linear regressors like stochastic gradient descent regressors based on a linear SVM. And it also turns out that that approach also works out quite well, for example, for the prediction of quantiles of the waiting time distribution. Future research will include of course, the application to more difficult queuing systems and especially queuing networks. And it will also be about trying to incorporate existing analytical approximations for queuing systems that are quite difficult to capture. And the comparison to white box modeling approaches like genetic programming will also play a major role. All right, uh, thank you very much. So this wraps up this session.